God, it is so great to be live again, and it's also great to be live and virtual. So there's a global audience and there's a local audience. And one of our board chairs is here, Joe Feshbach, and he insists on things being live. So we're doing this for you, Joe. Uh, <laughs> uh, Andrew Yang is the perfect guest here for the 92nd Street Y and folks because he's a man who's brimming with original ideas. Uh, the program that we run is really about honoring new ideas, original ideas, and having conversations about them. And I think it's fair to say that when he announced his decision to run for the presidency, and if you- Well, wait, wait. So the feedback yeah. I got was president of? The United States. <laughs> <laughs> Well, because I, I was uh, an anonymous civilian at that time, so yes. when I said I'm running for president, literally even close friends of mine said, of. Yeah, <laughs> in fact, in the... Finish the sentence. Well, th this book, which is both uh, the name forward, is a, in some ways a personal memoir about running for the presidency of the United States, and it's a no-holds-bar uh, remembrance. You know, he tells pretty much all the, some of it uh, funny, uh, humorous, uh, um, humbling stories about being on the campaign trail and lasting as long as he did because, in fact, he's quite right. No, none of his friends said, you've got to, you can't be for the presidency of the United States. And I forgot, how many people did you eventually outpoll? Governors, congressmen, senators? You went, that was a big loaded field at first, right? Yeah, I, I think uh, I outcompeted 14 other candidates. I made seven national debates, raised $40 million from almost half a million Americans, uh, which is very, very touching because for an everyday American to actually bust out their credit card and, and donate to a candidate uh, was really um, energizing and invigorating. It made, it made me feel like, okay, these people have actually invested their hopes and ambitions for the future in me, so I, I'd better not let them down. So the book, uh forward is both a book and it's also a movement uh, because as Andrew experienced life on the campaign trail and he also briefly ran for mayor of New York, he came away with a lot of lessons. Some of those policy prescriptions that are in the book, because the book is in some ways not just a memoir, but it's, am I still on? It's not just a memoir, but it's a, 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 a policy prescriptions for good governance and even overhauling the American election system. Again, the book is filled with original ideas. We will try to cover a number of them today, but it is extraordinary that you will not find in American political conversation this kind of a candidate who came in not just fresh and raw, but said, I'm coming in with original ideas, stuff that you won't imagine that could be uh, implemented in our system making the elections different and making governance difference itself. And his criticisms of our system itself are things that I think we vi viscerally understand, but he makes it very concrete. Um, so with that, Andrew, let's start with what first, uh, your first big issue, and there's many, but I, I can't not start with the first one, is the concept of universal basic income. Uh, because it's where one should start with Andrew Yang, but I also think because in the post-COVID era, I wonder whether, and this is the basic idea that you said, look, uh, why can't, here's something concrete and tangible that we can do for people. Give everyone a check for $1,000 a month, and let's see how that does. And you had experimented in your own way uh, as a, a, a corporate president and a nonprofit president to actually test it out. So it was sort of market tested before the COVID relief, and I'm wondering, for the people who thought this was just preposterous, do you feel vindicated because, in fact, the stimulus checks mirror that idea? And when you were on the campaign trail, I think you were not only arguing, you were arguing for more. You were saying, this is working, and why shouldn't we continue to do this? So it was sort of a terrible, happy accident that the COVID relief stimulus actually implemented the very things that you suggested and polling now shows that people actually agree with it. Yeah, you know, when I launched my presidential campaign, about 27% of Americans were for something called universal basic income, which I rechristened the freedom dividend because it tested better with Republicans with the word freedom in it. Uh, if you were- And dividend. 
And if dividend you're in the stock were, market, you said, I know what a dividend is. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it tested the same with liberals and Democrats, no matter what you called it, social security for all, prosperity, dividend, like, whatever. Um, and conservatives didn't like it until I had the word freedom in it. So be, being practical, I said, sure, freedom dividend. <laughs> Let's go with that. Uh, Remember and, freedom fries? This has been done before, right? Yeah, it, it, was, it was good fun. Uh, and when this was tested last year, about 65% of Americans were for it. So if that had been true when I was running for office, I, I'm, I'm sure I would have uh, done better. Uh, but that was my goal. So I, I'd spent the previous six years running a nonprofit that I'd started called Venture for America with a goal of creating job growth in uh, Detroit, Birmingham, Cleveland, New Orleans, St. Louis, and other cities around the country. And I'd seen the aftermath of the automation of manufacturing jobs in a lot of those communities. And if you looked at the voter district data in 2016 when Trump won, uh, he won Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, uh, all these states that had suffered from the, after, from, from the automation of these manufacturing jobs. And, if, and, and a district by district map, the single biggest correlation you could see was that if you did away with manufacturing jobs in a district, it went from blue to red or purple to red. Uh, and I did not think that our country was having that conversation. There was this entire inflammation against Trump saying, look, he's terrible, he's terrible. And, and I thought this guy's a symptom of a disease that is just going to accelerate because all of my friends in Silicon Valley are working on automating away not just manufacturing jobs. So I'm, I'm going to run a straw poll here because it'll be fun. What percentage of Americans graduate from college? Go ahead, shout it out. 60? Uh, it, it's about 35%. Uh, man with a Phillies hat, I guess you're, you're having a good week. Um, so, <laughs> my Mets cap, not as, not as much. It's useless. Um, so, <laughs> it'll be back. <laughs> Come on, Steve. All right, so, um, so two thirds of the country is, is con comprised of high school graduates in terms of their interaction with the economy. Uh, the five most common job types in the United States are, actually I'll have you guys, you guys guess this too, like shout out the most common jobs in the, in the economy. Trucking is number four, trucking and transportation. Service. Food service is number three. Retail, Retail is number two. Healthcare. Um, healthcare is an industry would be, but it, it has lots of little jobs in it. Uh, number one is clerical and administrative, which includes call centers. And you're not going to believe this, but number five is still manufacturing. Uh, so what proportion of American jobs falls into one of those five? Clerical and administrative, retail, food service, trucking and transportation, or manufacturing? What percentage do you think, those five? It's about half, 50% uh, of those jobs. And if you look at them, you can see they're all going to shrink pretty quickly. I mean, retail, very clearly. Well, especially Clerical the call center you talked about in the book, right? Because AI, the yeah. call centers are just now, everything is automated. Sure, I mean, when do you think Google's AI is gonna be able to do the work of American call center workers, of which there are about two and a half million, making 16 to 17 bucks an hour? I mean, probably right now, right? Like, to the extent that those workers still exist, it's because the company hasn't gotten around <laughs> to automating their jobs. So these are the obvious ones, but there are dozens of inobvious ones, including in white collar settings, uh, like finance and insurance and, and law and a bunch of other industries. So we're, we're going to be stripping away opportunities uh, from Americans of different groups. We've already done it to a lot of folks in these uh, manufacturing states, and that's what drove Trump into office. So I, I was running on this desire to mainstream the realities of the fourth industrial revolution, and then what would be, to me, uh, uh, a policy solution, which was universal basic income, which was championed by Martin Luther King, uh, Milton Friedman, Thomas Paine, a, a bunch of people before I came along. Uh, and so that was my goal in running for president, it's twofold. One, explain uh, the economic transformation and the marginalization of American workers, and number two, try and accelerate the adoption of universal basic income and ameliorate but, but mass Andrew, poverty. I just wanted you to address something, because you can mention Martin Luther King and Thomas Paine, but you're talking about a country that has always been, uh, it's, like, it, it, it's almost like a radioactive word, socialism. Right? We've had this endlessly of this discussion, FDR, the New Deal, 
Uh, I grew up in Miami, so among Hispanics in Miami, this is a dangerous thing. I think it's extraordinary that in this country you were introducing this idea of a handout. The, now, I think most people who receive Medicare or uh, Medicaid, Social Security benefits, they're getting a handout. But there's a large percentage of Americans that would just on principle say, we don't hand money. The government just doesn't hand people a check. Clearly, you were, it was an original idea, but not one that would be obviously uh, accepted. What I described it as is capitalism where your income doesn't start at zero. Uh, and the fact is consumer markets function much worse if you don't have money to spend, if you have more and more people who are disconnected to the economy, which, by the way, is just going to, to keep happening. And the pandemic sped a lot of this up. Um, and I would push back, though I appreciate the credit, Dane. Uh, the idea was not original. Like the, the, To the extent that there was any originality, it was in the name the Freedom Dividend and in the magical Asian man from the future running for president on it. Like Those <laughs> things were original. Um, but the ideas were very much uh, there for anyone to find. Uh, and it was a, a young black mayor named Michael Tubbs who said something to me. He, were, he and I were on our panel together. He said, Andrew, you can get away with saying shit that I could never say because if the young black mayor went around saying, hey, we should uh, alleviate gross poverty, people would be like, ah, you're, you're nuts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but if the tech guy is saying it, then all of a sudden people are like, oh, let, let, let's hear him out. Um, so uh, the, the, the goal was to try and speed up our adoption uh, of meaningful countermeasures to an economic transformation that's just going to speed up. Right. How did I do? Uh, you, did, you did great. <laughs> so, but so do you, can, let me just ask you though, uh, the numbers now show that more people support this. Yes. Would they have supported it had the coronavirus not hit and people were receiving? In other words, are we in the mood for this idea because we started receiving checks during the pandemic? Uh, and if, if in fact, it, it doesn't matter, it's been, as you say in the book, normalized, right? If, in fact, it's been normalized, what has to happen next? Does Andrew Yang have to actually get elected to something because you know there's so many policy prescriptions in here and we're going to get to some of the things about it does seem like in our system it's a little intractable you have original ideas but you're up against a world that is locked in to a way of doing things and you've presented so many different ideas i'm not sure that they can deal with all of them and it and there's incentives against them so I'm wondering, did you catch a wave with the pandemic? And do you have something here that you can take to the next level? Or is this something we have the benefit of hearing, but we may not hear it again? The, the biggest data set we have for the good that this kind of cash can do is the enhanced child tax credit that was passed as part of the relief package uh, and then was discontinued at the beginning of this year. And Something like 174 economists signed a letter saying we should keep applying this enhanced child tax credit because all of the data says that the families are spending money on food, fuel, school supplies. Uh, it brought millions of American kids out of poverty. Uh, anyone looking at it objectively would say, hey, this policy has been the best thing that we've done. So of course, in today's political system, we discontinued it in January uh, for political reasons. And one of the things that gave me a, a big sinking feeling during January was that there was no hue and cry, there were no protests. Like, like, imagine millions of American families getting, in many cases, about you know five or six hundred dollars a child. So if you had a couple children, it might be a thousand bucks. It'd be a lifeline in a country where you know, so many Americans are living hand to mouth. Um, and then you take it away, and nothing happens really. There are some journalists who say, hey, that was terrible that we discontinued this. And by the way, a, a, a more recent study came out saying that to the extent that Democrats had any hope of winning two weeks from now, it, they would be dramatically bolstered by the child tax credit because many, many uh, families in every environment were benefiting from it. Um, now, any, any objective criteria unfortunately now falls prey to our politics. Right. Uh, and this is one of the things that I uh, tried to 
figure out after I came off the trail. So imagine this, imagine you're me. You come off the trail in February, March 2020 and your campaign exceeded expectations, but you still feel despondent about the direction of American politics. You still feel like we're heading towards disaster, which many of you probably sense on some level and there are different reasons why you think that we're heading towards disaster, but we are, you're correct. Uh, and so then throughout the rest of 2020, I try and figure out why I feel this way, why we feel this way, and then what we could do about it. And the, the reason why the child tax credit fails, the reason why just about any uh, policy you can imagine will not pass is because we're in the midst of suffering through the worst design flaw in the history of the world, uh, which is our current two-party system. Um, so I'm just gonna throw a couple numbers well, out and then we'll come back to this thing. What do you think the, approval rating is of U.S. Congress as we're here together tonight? I'm anchoring you low. It's, it is quite low. Um, it's between 20 and 28 percent. So three out of four Americans unhappy with what's, ha what's going on or not going on in Congress. What is the re-election rate for individual members of Congress? 90 percent. 94 percent. Um, so imagine a, a business where three out of four customers were unhappy and then nothing changed. Uh, and then you have to look at it and say, well, why is it that everyone gets reelected if, if Americans are upset all the time? And the reason is that in 90% of the district races around the country, it is uncompetitive in the general election. You know it's gonna be a Democrat or Republican. So the only way they can lose is if they get primaried from within their own party, which ends up distorting their incentives very, very extremely, because if I wanna keep my job, I just have to keep the 10% most extreme crazies in, in some cases off my back and then I'm, I, I win my job back. Um, if I compromise what happens, I get attacked from within my party, I'm ideologically disloyal. impure. Right. I worked with the enemy. It was a US senator who said to me, an issue is worth more to us unaddressed than addressed. Because if it's unaddressed, I can get you mad, I can get votes, I can raise money. If I reach across the aisle and solve it, then I take a beating, my job security goes down, I might lose my job forever. Uh, so that is why we all feel the way we do. We are being set up to fail by a system that has these incentives that actually will reward bad performance and polarization as opposed to any form of problem solving or solutions, including the child tax credit. So I'm gonna come back to that. I'm gonna, let's go to some things. I wanna go a little off the book, things that I don't think people talk about as much with you, but I thought were really important and were really original. Um, I, I want to say a little of what you call uh, grace and tolerance. Uh, this is a blue state. Uh, Donald Trump is from this state and this city, but he's profoundly unpopular. And this is a state, we had a U.S. senator named Hillary Clinton that during the election, you know, used the words deplorables. And in your book, you make some interesting claims, which is fascinating. He uses behavioral psychology as his marker. But we're genetically programmed, at least half of us, half of who, how we become a Democrat or Republican is genetically programmed. You, you're born either a Democrat or Republican from birth. And this comes out in this book. And so one of the points that he raises, which I thought, again, in this era, we don't see Democrats who are at least from the progressive side say this, where you're saying, that the idea of recognizing that there's 77 million people who voted for Donald Trump and thinking of them as only, you know, you're saying, at one point you said, it's the only discrimination that is acceptable today. Oh, right. Which was an Ezra Klein quote, too. Oh, right, right. Like, Ezra, I, I, yeah. I, I like quoting people that people won't get mad at. <laughs> because the only, dis like, the hey, only discrimination Ezra is to dis said it. discriminate against the Trump voter is perfectly acceptable in New York and to think of them as boneheads. And yet, how is anything going to be accomplished when you're dealing with that number of people? Yeah, and, and this is- And you call and, it grace and tolerance. Um, this is born of my experience meeting literally thousands of Americans in rural Iowa or Ohio or New Hampshire, where um, I would talk to a waitress in a diner and I'd say, hey, I'm running for president. And she would say, really, what party? And I'd say, Democrat. And then she'd be like, oh. And I'd be like, what did I say? You know, like, like it's like I just turned purple or, or you know. Um, so uh, I got that reaction from many, many uh, Americans. And I also met many, many Trump voters who were just desperate 
who felt like their, their kids are going to be worse off than them and they're looking up and they, they think that politicians are corrupt and they're, uh, they're uh, patronized and condescended to by, by the media. Uh, and so they just said, look, this guy's uh, a rock thrower uh, and a bomb thrower, but at least he's not one of these corrupt captured uh, politicians, which by the way is one reason why 42% of my supporters said they weren't sure they were going to support the, the Democrat um, in the general because they sensed in me the same anti-establishment um, nature. Uh, they was, didn't feel a second choice was for them in the Democratic Party. Uh, yeah, the, so the, this one woman said something that really touched me where she told uh, a pollster, she said, if not Trump, Yang. And then the pollster said, why Yang? And she said, he's the only one who doesn't seem like he's judging me. Uh, they, they just feel very judged by the media and a lot of the Democrats um, who they, they see running. Um, and they're voting for Trump for a host of reasons. Now, I obviously you know, like, uh, think Trump should be nowhere near the Oval Office uh, and uh, ran against him. But when I ran against him, I didn't rail against him um, as my primary messaging. When I would talk to people, I'd just say, OK, like, why are things going so poorly? here, and I, I do want to speak to this because th th this is part of the disease we have to counter. I spent months in Iowa. Iowa was a bellwether state. How, how recently? Like Obama won it um, in the general. Iowa, Missouri, Ohio, all were the uh, quintessential swing states. Remember this? Now all of them are plus eight, plus nine Republican. Um, and when you go to Democrats and say, hey, what's going on in Iowa, Missouri, Ohio, what's the response you get? Don't worry about it. We're trading them for the more diverse states of Georgia, Nevada, and Virginia. So what happens in those states is immaterial to us now. So there are all of these people who fought and bled for the Democrats in those states who just feel abandoned. And written and, off. Written off. And, and by the way, those states are majority white, um, industrial, Midwestern states. And so you see this polarization. It's in part because the political interests are not around improving anyone's life. It's just, uh, let me eke out the next national election. And if I can trade your electoral votes for these electoral votes. Um, so if you spend a lot of time in Iowa or Ohio or Missouri, you, st you start to feel really uh, you know, disheartened for, for those people. And then when they turn to Trump, um, or frankly, the successors to Trump, because anyone who thinks Trumpism is going to fade when Trump is gone is going to be very, very disappointed. Like Trumpism is going to metastasize into something even nastier than Trump, potentially. And that's, it, you know, it's, it's impossible to imagine. You're like, how could it be nastier than Trump? But, um, but, but I, I believe that this is what lies ahead. But you said something a moment ago, and it was said offhanded, but I think it comes up in the book a lot, which is, I... Wouldn't, I don't think Trump should be in the Oval Office, but I didn't campaign against him, right? I didn't go negative against him. Well, I didn't him. trash the people who right, voted for trash, him. Right, well, that's right. And I think in the book you point out, again, you did things in the campaign and you're pointing things in the book that are counterintuitive to the way we experience them on cable news. Because, well, for, instance, for instance, you say in the book, going negative is exactly what cable news does they mm. want to hear the ne they want to hear your politician the person you want to vote for be negative against everyone else right not about offering anything but going negative and it and i and that's why i want to get into this next subject because you do a very good job of talking about that we don't have an agreed set of facts anymore right as a country it's absurd that we all walk around with our own facts and that it's corrupted by the way we receive information, and it's also corrupted by the way entities like Google and Facebook gather our information, right? Target our information. So, you know, I'm reminded when I was, I'm older than pretty much everyone in this room, uh, but when I was a little boy watching Walter Cronkite, there was only three stations. I remember too. There was no, you were diapers. No, no, uh, I was there, I, yeah. and, then and then Fox came up, right, and right, it but, had The Simpsons and Married with Children, ever, and it was like the right, only programming. No program. one knew what party Walter Cronkite was voting for. It would never occur to anybody. They wouldn't possibly have known anything like this. And today, and the way you describe it, it's very interesting because people, you know, were both lawyers. You know, the end of the fairness doctrine really had a lot to do with this because it gave birth to Fox and you know MSNBC and CNN and Newsmax, where you have these ideological, agenda-driven, partisan enterprises that are really sort of telling you what to think 
instead of giving you objective news and and are attracted to negative things yeah. right they're attracted to candidates that that make jokes about other people or attack their opponents so when a moment ago you said in this room you think what do you mean of course you would have attacked Donald Trump and I said you just said a moment ago actually I didn't attack my opponents I just that's not what I did I was doing something else Again, that's not something we're used to. We weren't used to someone like you that said, I'm not going to spend my time attacking my opponents. I'm going to offer you something new. <laughs> yeah. So the political incentives I was describing before are compounded now by the fact that media organizations separate us into ideological tribes because they found that if you give an audience what they want, then they'll come back. <laughs> uh, like it's, it's pretty simple. Um, uh, and then social media pours gasoline on the whole thing. Um, now. About 42% of Democrats regard Republicans as corrupt and a threat to the country. And shocker, the same percentage of Republicans feel, <laughs> feel that way about Democrats. Uh, and there are very few news sources that you can identify where you don't know which team they're on uh, at, at, at this point. Um, so when Thane was talking about the different facts uh, that we have, the, the internet has taken those three TV channels and the uniform public discourse and then splintered it into a thousand pieces. And the relationship with the media now falls along partisan lines. Uh, and the, the, the things to know, it's like it's not left versus right at this point anymore. It's outside versus uh, people on the inside, where it, it's people who don't think institutions are working for them versus the people that do. Uh, if you look at trust in media uh, and map it along partisan lines, 69% of Democrats have a high trust in media, think the media plays it straight. You go to Republicans, it goes down to 15%. They think that the media is full of shit, um, and, and including even some of their own, <laughs> you know, like, like that. And then if, if you ask independents, it's 39%, which falls right in between. So when you wonder how the heck there are all these election deniers and, and people that believe in these conspiracy theories, what ha what's happened is that they've uh, had their trust in institutions totally fractured. And then if a YouTuber or someone on Facebook's like, hey, hey, like here's the dirt, here's a skinny, and, and they're but lying to you, just then, little... they, then they eat it up because they say, like, I knew it. I, 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 like, because they, they lost faith some time ago. But, but also because of the internet and social media, they're given a multiplicity of options. And, right? and also the, the various influencers profit uh, from, from being more virulent and sensationalistic. In fact, you uh, gave a statistic that people, w what goes viral is v violence or negative. Yeah. If it's negative or violent, it goes viral. If it's positive and not violent, no one's really interested it, in it. It's one eighth as viral if you say something positive. Uh, it's eight, eight times more likely to spread if it's untrue. <laughs> so if you, you want to get more followers, just lie your ass off and then you know, you'll know you see so, your followership so grow pretty quick. So it becomes almost impossible to get an agreed set of facts because there are so many competitive sources out there giving the various versions of it. But there's something in your book that I want you to address that no one thinks about, which is the effect on the end of the local newspaper. Oh yeah. Like that's something that's in your book that I thought was a very original idea we all, at least my generation, there were lots of newspapers and they were local newspapers. And what was the number you said? Uh, how many thousands of newspapers, 30,000 reporters lost jobs. And 2,000 newspapers. 2,000 newspapers went away. And when that happened, there's actually no local reporting, which right. also makes it harder to run for Congress. <laughs> yes, it makes it harder to run for local office. But if you think about local journalism, it tended to be less ideological because how are you going to um, report on high school sports and the bridge needing repair in, in a partisan manner? <laughs> but then, the, then you do away with that and then it just becomes Fox versus MSNBC and like different Facebook influencers. So the, the loss of local papers has uh, un unfortunately uh, now nationalized even local politics uh, and we're seeing that in different ways. Uh, so I suggest, look, if you wanted to combat polarization, you should try and resuscitate local journalism because it, it's a, a natural uh, fabric builder in a community. And by the way, the absence of it is shown to have negative effects on governance, uh, the cost of municipal bonds, <laughs> the, the number of people who run for local office. Uh, if you believe in democracy, so what's By the way, that's a, I'm sorry, that's a very good point when you said you pointed that out. The founding fathers were not thinking about CNN when they said freedom of the press. They were actually thinking about local papers. Yeah, it's, so it's one of the facets now of, of uh, American thinking that if the market 
has no use for something, then it should die. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what's happened with journalism was that it, it used to be that local papers had a thriving business um, through want ads and classifieds uh, and local advertising, and then Craigslist ate it all. Um, and so then those 2,000 papers and those 30,000 journalists started losing their jobs, and everyone just shrugged and said, oh, well, like, I, I guess that's that. Um, not realizing that the decimation of these papers would result in news deserts that then gets filled by uh, cable news or uh, influencers or conspiracy theorists and the, the rest of it. So I posed a plan, look, we should try and anchor new papers in town libraries, which by the way, librarians are among the most trusted uh, figures in American life now. <laughs> and, and no one looks at a library and is like, it doesn't make money, screw it, let's destroy it. You know, <laughs> so um, so there, there should be some kind of public-private relationship with local journalism um, and philanthropic relationship, but if you say these things, everyone's like, no, 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 because uh, like there, there's something where the government can't touch journalism, even though, by the way, the same people will just turn on NPR or watch PBS or, or like uh, read articles from the BBC and not even think about it. But then <laughs> if you have, uh, it, it, it's, if, if you believe in democracy, you're going to need to actually try and invest some resources in, in these directions. There are some philanthropists who are starting to move in this direction, but it's not going to be enough by the numbers. You know, like the, these philanthropists are investing typically, um, you know, seven or even eight figures in a context where you, you've lost um, several billion in, uh, in local advertising revenue. So you're a tech, you started out in tech, and yet as a candidate and in, as an author in this book, you point out the dangers of tech. In some oh yeah, and they're so, gonna ruin us. I mean, yeah. So at this point, social so, media is negatively related to democracy, right. not just here I, I in the US, but around the world. I think that's important that you address this idea of Facebook, Google, the path social pathologies that come about because of the addiction to social media, that social media, it's actually trying to be addictive. It's trying to gather information from you and sell the information, and they do sell it in enormously profitable ways. And as you point out, some of them don't even pay taxes, right? And as you point out, they want immunity under Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. So on the one hand, Z Zuckerberg in Facebook is, is selling the data that you give him based on your preferences. And then he's saying, I'm a newspaper. I, I'm, I have a First Amendment right. I'm nothing, as you point out in the book, I'm nothing but a bulletin board. And you quite correctly point out, you're not a bulletin board if you, you have algorithms that are there to hook my preference up with other people and then you sell that data for money. That's not a bu bulletin board. There's an affirmative step that they've taken to give it, it's not like I'm neutral on news. He's not neutral on news. So I talk a little about these dangers because most people would not expect a tech person to actually take an anti-tech tech position. In many ways, social media is the reverse of local journalism, where the, the market support for local journalism died, and so everyone's like, well, I guess they're gone now. Uh, where, whereas social media is now the market turned up to 11 and just allowed to run amok. You get the Spinal uh, Tap reference, right? Okay, I just want to make sure. Right. <laughs> so I, I, look, see, contemporary, <laughs> the same taste in music, all sorts of things. Uh, our data is now getting sold and resold for in excess of 200 billion a year, of which we're seeing nothing. Uh, and uh, that's being used to micro-target us. So um, explain that again, 2 billion. 200 billion a year. 200 billion a year. Our, our, our data uh, what is you being search, sold and resold. What you do. Yeah profiles of, of, of each of us. Um, and they say, no, no, don't worry, it's anonymized, anonymized. Uh, but uh, you know, at this point, they've layered over so many like, <laughs> like, like pieces of data and metadata that they've got um, very, very good profiles. Uh, and that's how they now have reached trillion dollar valuations. Uh, when Section 230 was written, it was in the 90s and none of these companies even existed. If you wanted to trace the steps, uh, the Fairness Doctrine goes away in 1987 or so. Wait, one uh, second, just to make sure everybody remembers what that was, right? I just That's you had to present both sides of a political issue. So when you, you go back to those old timey documentaries, it's always like two people in, in jackets politely talking, a little bit like this. Yeah. Uh, um, but then they, they did away with that in the, the 80s and then, uh, MSNBC and Fox get founded in the early 90s, then Facebook uh, comes online in 2004. Um, so all, all of these media trends have, have sped up and accelerated, and our government, in part because we have a gerontocracy, um, has just been like, well, you know, like these tech geniuses are just doing their thing, let them innovate. Um, meanwhile, well, it, it, it reached a point where they started to- they fund to campaigns. 
right? Uh, they're donors. Oh yeah, I mean, they're, like they, 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 they do lobby. Um, uh, and uh, that they, they do donate to. I mean, candidates there's a reason parties. why candidates might shrug their shoulders and say, "What do you want to do about it?" Because they already got a check from Apple. Yeah, and, and fundamentally, again, like our political figures are, are driven by uh, their own trajectory and, and professional success. So, what happens in terms of policy is is uh, irrelevant, more or less. So, if you were to say to a political figure, "Hey," By the way, teenage girls are now uh, depressed and anxious at record levels because of Instagram and social media and the like. Doesn't matter. <laughs> no, no, you, you would think that would matter because they're human beings with kids. No, like it, 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 irrelevant. I mean, th there are all of these issues that fall into that bucket. By the way, poverty is now in this bucket too. Like it turns out poverty, like it doesn't have any political upside to address poverty. Like irrelevant. So. Um, that's how you can do away with the child tax credit that is demonstrably dragging millions of American kids out, out of poverty and then do away with it and then you know nothing happens politically. So, uh, so we, we have a political system that is more or less unresponsive and unaccountable to us. Um, and uh, this is true, uh, you know, uh, it's just, just true by design. Um, and you're being told, look, the problem is those people over there who you disagree with um, uh, on various issues. Uh, and um, really, they're, they're grasping for like a life preserver, trying to, to, to do something. Like there are people on both sides that are grasping, but at this point, we're being played against each other ideologically because that's the setup. Uh, you know, like like trying to solve the root problems is a political loser. We're now 31st in the world at public education, clean water, infant mortality, life expectancy, like any of the standards, like we're disintegrating. Uh, and uh, th there are different people who are responding to the disintegration in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, but the disintegration is again, uh, more or less irrelevant to, to political figures. So let's pick up on that idea. Another original idea is, and there are probably some people here that you know are familiar with the stock market or work on Wall Street, the way we measure things of success as a government, GDP, we take for granted that GDP is the key thing. Or you hear this all the time. Certainly Trump supporters said there was a booming stock market, right? You hear the word booming stock market all the time. And you're saying, well, wait a minute, maybe there should be something called human capitalism. How do you do humanize the economy? And what, it, what is it that we measure? We just decide in GDP to measure certain things, but we can measure other things. And then we can actually have a report card for how the government is actually achieving in certain levels of measurement. And you say that Democrats could have a list of what they think we should measure, right? I mean, that you could, it doesn't have to be two things, that we can measure more things, but in the end, it measures human fulfillment. That yeah. That's what it should be measuring, not uh, maximizing corporate value, shareholder value, but maximizing human value. And, and, and I don't know anyone who's saying this. So go ahead. Oh, well, well thank you, Thane. So my, my idea, not that complicated, is just to have a dashboard up in the halls of Congress showing various measurements for how Americans are doing. <laughs> <laughs> and then you could point to it and say um, how your policies are moving things in the right direction. Um, and, and but you're saying like point, suicides are down, right? If you said uh, things like that, right? Yes, she, she, or, or most depression. recently, I'm a parent, I've got a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old. The fact that our country's kids uh, reading and math scores just went off a cliff over the last two years. I mean, that's unconscionable. We're going to be trying to, to dig out of that. We've ruined so many lives uh, and we're looking at it now. And then if you, uh, I mean, if you play out what that's going to mean generationally, it's devastating. Um, so we should have that as a measurement, I would say. And then hold our leaders accountable and say, hey guys, we'd really love it if our kids start learning better. Uh, you know, like, 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 like let's, let's have that be, <laughs> one of the standards of whether you win office uh, or not. But in this system, again, you have a 94% reelect rate because 90% of the districts are uncompetitive. So, uh, so they, they don't need to worry about it. Like th there's no real need to compete. Um, so what you do is you just have some performance baselines. You ask your legislators, look, just point out whatever measurement you, you're gonna work on and improve. Like I almost don't care which one, as long as you, you've, you hold yourself accountable to some performance. Uh, and then you replace this party primary that disproportionately empowers uh, the extreme 10 to 12% uh, of voters who are now ideological and not terribly reasonable, um, certainly on, on one side, and I, you could argue for the other side. 
um, and replace it with nonpartisan primaries and ranked choice voting so anyone can vote for anyone of any party, which by the way, they rolled out in Alaska in 2020, and then you saw all the headlines last month, which were what? Sarah Palin loses, Mary Peltola, the native uh, Alaskan wins, who, Mary Peltola had 9% in the first round of that uh, election. Like in a conventional system, she goes nowhere near the halls of Congress. Overlooked, Lisa Murkowski made it back through the primary too as the only Republican senator who voted to impeach Donald Trump, who's also up for re-election this year. If you look at the 10 House Republicans who voted to impeach Donald Trump, how many of them made it through the primary? Two. And those two had a funky uh, jungle primary system where the top two of any party got through and you know they may or may not win the, their, their general. Do you think Republicans didn't notice this? <laughs> like any Republican voted to impeach Trump, their career ended. Um, and so Lisa Murkowski's career does not end. Why? Because Alaska actually did away with their party primary. If there was a Republican primary, Lisa Murkowski's career is over. And by the way, if they had a, a Republican primary, maybe Lisa Murkowski doesn't vote to impeach Trump because she would know that her career is over if she votes to impeach Trump. So anyone who's like, oh, Andrew, like the two party systems carved in stone, it's like, look, Alaska already made this move. You know how much that ballot initiative in Alaska cost in 2020? $6 million. Uh, so do you think it would be worthwhile to make similar investments in 24 other states that all have ballot initiatives? By the way, this ballot initiative is on the ballot in Nevada in two weeks. They could do away with their party primary uh, and give rise to like a whole, the, the biggest thing is like, look, even if the same humans win office in this new system, they actually have to deliver to win office um, again, because they'll have to come back and say, look, I need to convince 51% of you I'm doing a good job. It's not just these 10% on the side, or if I just throw them some ideological red meat, they'll just like stay off my back. <laughs> I actually have to, to, to deliver. Um, uh, and so this, this is the way out to try and introduce this scoreboard uh, that our leaders should be accountable for. Because by any measurement, our, our way of life is going down the tubes. So quickly just explain, because we, we're in New York and we actually have ranked choice voting, right? Yes. But, but I'm not sure everyone is familiar with it. One of the reasons is that you said only 20% of the people vote in primaries, right? So we have a, a system that's not set up to elect someone, certainly with a lot of original ideas and who isn't an incumbent, and who is coming from not one of those parties and abiding his time and being loyal to the party. I mean, you've described this with Lisa Mukowski, but I think it's important to point out the overhaul that you're contemplating, right? Open primaries, just if we can just briefly talk about how that would work in practice and why that would make a big difference. Sure. So. Uh I could continue to use Alaska as the example. So the, in the Alaskan system now, voters can vote for anyone of any party in the primary, and the top four get through uh, as determined, and the winner's chosen by ranked choice voting, which if you're not familiar with ranked choice voting, you can rank more than one candidate, and if no one gets 50.1%, then the votes for the weakest candidate get reallocated uh, based upon their second choice, and this process gets repeated until someone gets over the finish line with a majority. There are so many positives to this process. Uh, one is that you can vote for anyone you want without fear of wasting a vote or spoiling anything. It encourages positive campaigning because if I just attack this other person, then we both look bad, and then this third person comes up. Women and underrepresented minorities uh, have advantages in this system. Um, because they might end up second or third on everybody's list. Yes. And therefore, at the end, they actually could win. They don't have to be first on anyone's list to actually win. And, right? and, and I do think women are generally more collegial. Um, where they're, 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 There are actually some women candidates who said they only ran because it was ranked towards voting and, and they thought they could be uh, you know, conciliatory and still win instead of being asked to be a, a bomb thrower or, or an ideologue. Um, so rank choice voting uh, rewards moderation and reasonableness. Uh, the, getting the majority appeal is a big deal. I mean, that's why Sarah Palin lost. Um, where you have people in different races, I'm gonna call one out who I actually saw here at the 92nd Street Y a number of years ago, J.D. Vance uh, in Ohio. He won his primary with, I think, 32%. Um, of the vote because there were multiple candidates. Like you have people all the time getting through their races with like 25, 30% of the vote because there are multiple candidates. 
uh, Donald Trump rolled through the Republican primary, and by the way, will roll through this primary too, because the process is still the same. If you have 35, 40%, everyone else has 10, 12%, then you're rolling, um, even if it turns out the majority of the people don't like you. So there so are- So the point is right, you need to get 51%. So, so, so the, yeah. the, in the end, you, they'll just keep reallocating numbers below until it moves someone above. above so so the, the winner has to have some kind of majority appeal. And so if you're sick of the polarization, the inflammation, the rest of it, you just should be for ranked choice voting and nonpartisan primaries because it'll actually line up our uh, leaders' incentives to please us. The, the average voter and not just the special interests on the side. But uh, I do want to point out, I'm going to guess most of you are Democrats because we're here in New York. Uh, I was a Democrat for a long time. So this ballot initiative that's uh, uh, in Nevada in November, uh, the Democrats have spent seven figures against it. Why? Because the Democrats right now have control of Nevada and they say, wait, if you open the system up, then I might have to compete, I might have to deliver, I might have to be accountable, don't like it. Or, you know, I just went to my, my consultants and said, hey, what do we think? And the consultants like, don't like it because right now we know what to do to win this race and keep those voters happy. And then if we do this, then we'll have to try and make all voters happy. Don't know who all voters are. Like we just know who like our hyper-partisans are. Um, so if you were a Democrat and you think like, oh, like Democrats would be for this and Republicans would hate it, like it, it doesn't actually play out like that in real life because Democrats will be against anything that's against their interest in a particular jurisdiction. Alaska that adopted this thing, Alaska's a red state. You know, if you go to Republicans and say, hey, do you want to vote for anyone you want? Republicans are much more likely to raise their hand and say yes, <laughs> because they're a little bit more anti-institutionalist. So the, the whole thing is actually a bit of a, a web or a mess. Um, uh, and so I figured all this out in 2020. Could like, you just add a couple other things to this, democracy dollars and term limits? Sure. Um, so, uh, so there, there were one of the ways that you can try and counter the uh, the big money interest in uh, politics is just give people 50 bucks that they can give to any candidate they want, which Seattle did, uh, which all by the way also helped women candidates and. Uh, minority candidates, and it made people who were previously totally uninvolved in the democratic process feel like savvy investors. They were like, ooh, I've got 50 bucks, like who am I gonna give it to? <laughs> they started paying attention to the race because before that, a, a very narrow slice of the population right now gives to uh, political campaigns. It's, it's not a normal behavior. If you do it, thank you, congrats, congrats it's awesome. It's like top 10% of the population might give uh, to a political campaign. So if you give someone free money or vouchers, then all of a sudden you see that number shoot up. And, and term limits. Uh, so, so term limits is something that 75% of Americans are for. Uh, just instinctively they think, hey, when I send you to DC, I don't want you to be there forever. I want you to do something and come back eventually. I don't want this to be like a career destination for you. Um, that's cross-partisan. Um, uh, and so that, that's, now there, there are counter arguments uh, to term limits, but I think on balance, like, I'm for it. Um, and, and in part because it sends a very, very clear uh, anti-corruption for the people message that you're not going, and you know, it's funny too. I was, I was talking to a guy named David Rubenstein, who many of you know, um, and, and he said that when he talks to members of Congress, they, they, their biggest fear is losing their seat. Um, but then he talks to ex-members of Congress and they've never been happier. You know, <laughs> he says consistently. Um, so, so that that's uh, you know something we can take advantage of. It's like, look, you you think that you're going to hate it, but you actually enjoy life more after you get out of this. <laughs> so, but right now they're all there, being like, I can't lose. You know what I mean? Well, and also you describe in the book that they most of them end up as lobbyists. Yeah, about half. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, so counterintuitively, I think we should be paying these people more. You know, I, I do not think they should be trading stock, but I think we could ratchet up the, their comp very significantly. Because 174,000 sounds like a lot to like the average American, but you maintain two homes, you travel back and forth, you're around uh, really rich people all the time. Like you just start being like, hey, you know, like I, I really should be trying to get in on something. Um, it's just human nature. So, uh, you know, I think there are structural improvements we could make. So the book is brimming with ideas. Uh, and re possible reforms for overhauling a lot of how we're governed. How, how do you imagine the next steps? Like, what, what are you doing? I know there is now not just a book, but there's a party, a forward party, and you could be a forward Democrat and you can be a forward Republican. You can buy, be either one. I assume you're now investing your time 
in galvanizing support for the party? I mean, is that the only, is in other words, do these reforms hinge on all of us joining the forward party? Is there a way to, because I don't know if, you know, that was the other thing, you know, the candidates that you ended up supporting after you dropped out, right, and you point out why you supported them, and a lot of them also believed in universal basic income, I think they all lost. Oh, well, I thought you were talking about my endorsing Joe Biden, who, no, no, who right. did win. Yeah, he did win, but I'm saying a lot of the congressional like, candidates. Joe lost? <laughs> yeah, I'm, a lot of the congressional candidates, I mean, it's not a... It, it's not a sanguine idea when you say well, these are great proposals, but what will it take to actually implement them if we're not electing Andrew Yangs? Well, well first let me say that uh, I was not raised with some deep desire for elective office. Uh, I, I'm Asian. <laughs> you know? My parents were like, you're going to be president someday. Like, that wasn't the conversation. Uh, it was, uh, so uh, I, like, I, I just want this country to work better for like all of us, for our kids. Uh, it's not working now. Um, and, and we have to home in on the real problems. Like the, the real problems are not that there are these Americans in another part of the country who we disagree with on, uh, on this and that. It's that we have this system that actually gets rewarded by agitation and inflammation and anger uh, and, and despair and increasingly incoherent uh, uh, ideological conversations uh, while like our, our communities are, um, you know, like disintegrating before our eyes in, in various ways because these institutions do not have to perform for us. Uh, they don't, you know, uh, so that's what I'm, I'm after trying to fix. And I have this, uh, <laughs> I have this frustration. Uh, let me try this out on you because, you know, I think you might have had this experience. How many of you have read a book th that has done a really excellent job of painting a problem? for you, like 200 pages, and by the end of it, you're like, yeah, yeah, these people, like, they, this author is spot on. And then when it gets to the solutions, it's like, yeah, and it just kind of fades away into nothing. It's like, I wish you could say this. How many of you have had that experience? Yeah, like, th that is now the norm in American life, where, it, like, I get rewarded for dissecting a problem in painstaking detail, but then if I suggest what to do about it, and really do about it, then I'm, political and I'm like, you know, like, uh, <laughs> like uh, controversial or, or, or whatnot. Um, so I, I don't have it in me to lay out these structural problems that are plaguing our democracy, our society, and then be like, yeah, someone should do something about that. Mm -hmm. uh, especially when now, for whatever reason, I might be on the list of people who might be able to do something about it. So when I completed this book, I said, uh, and so there, there are three ways you could try and pursue the reforms I'm describing around ranked choice voting and nonpartisan primaries and the rest of it. Number one, you could start a nonprofit. What's wrong with that approach? No one would care and it wouldn't work. <laughs> I mean, truly, you know what I mean? Um, you could also say it already exists. And that nonprofit does exist. It's called Fair Vote. I'm on the board. It's a great org. I should not say, like, Fair Vote's awesome. Sorry, Rob. Love you. Um, <laughs> so, so number one, nonprofit. Number two, try and make it happen from within the two-party system. What's wrong with that approach? Gives up on half the country immediately. You're, you're a Dem plot in any red state. You're a Republican plot in, in, in a blue state. Uh, it can't be done. So then the, the third option, the option I chose, which was, okay, you need to start a new uh, popular movement that, uh, that builds uh, a new political entity that then agitates for these reforms in Massachusetts, Mississippi, and every point in between. Uh, and so I said, what do you call that? Like, it's not left or right, it's forward. The forward party is one of my campaign slogans, so we, we went with forward. Uh, and we just merged with uh, the Renew America Movement and the Serve America Movement, which were two organizations that were more or less uh, frustrated moderate Republicans uh, with the direction of their party, because uh, like, like Renew America was trying to uh, support rational Republicans, guess what? They, they gave up. Like, it, it's a loser within these primaries. Again, eight out of 10 who voted to impeach Trump are out. Um, and so if you are a Democrat in this room, I'm going to suggest to you that we should pay more attention to what's going on outside of the, the party because what's going on in the Republican Party is of a very, very acute interest <laughs> to the future of this country. Yeah. Uh, and also, if you're concerned about authoritarianism, you have to face facts that within a two-party system, both sides will win. You know, like there is no plan that says, hey, you know what my plan is? Defeat the other party for all time, forever, everywhere. 
you know, like, like, like that seems to be the, the approach that some people have. It's like, that's the plan. It's like, hey, that plan will probably not work even two weeks from now. I mean, I hate to break news to you all, but like, you know, <laughs> like the forever plan is not a cogent plan. So then the only other plan that makes sense is to say we need to build a system that actually will be more resilient um, to encroaching authoritarianism or demagoguery, where if you have a terrible leader, the political incentives are not all just to fall in line behind that leader. You know, if you had a multi-party system here, which by the way, it's possible that we elect an independent senator two weeks from now named Evan McMullen uh, in Utah, who's running against Mike Lee, the Trump endorsed incumbent. How many senators does it take to influence policy in a polarized country? One. One. So you could say, hey, like Yang, like, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's like, this all could be true January of 23. Uh, you know, I was just in Utah campaigning for Evan and he has a great chance to win. And if you want to help him win, go to evanmcmullen.com. Um, so if, if you had a functional multi-party system and you have one party succumb to terrible leadership, the whole thing doesn't go down the tubes, right? Because he has to get another party on board to get anything done. And then people are like, hey, like, you know, like, which, um, so that, that is sensible. That's a much more sensible long-term plan than the I'm going to defeat one of the two major parties forever plan that people seem to, to think you know, is the correct approach. Like I, that approach, you know, again, it's probably going to fail us uh, in a couple of weeks just despite people's best efforts. All right, we're almost coming to an end. I want to make sure we get some questions, but not comments, just questions. Uh, take one or two, not comments, just two questions. Yes, over there. So uh, you touched on it with your reason number two, but Tell me more why you wouldn't be more involved and supportive of no labels. Uh, I'm very, very friendly with Nancy and No Labels. Um, what No Labels? So No Labels, those who don't know it, uh, it's an organization that's been encouraging bipartisanship for the past decade or, or so. Um, and one of the things that they have found is that there are fewer people to work with because the moderates have become an endangered species uh, in both parties in both houses. Right. Um, which, and I talked to a lot of those people, I mean, how many of them are, are out uh, at the end of December? Uh, you know, like that their, um, that their ranks are dwindling. It's the same thing that happened with Renew, is like the people that are after this, and I love no labels and encourage them to, to continue on the, in the mission, but even they, because they're smart and honest, looked up and say, hey, like, it's not working. Like, like our stuff is not working. So even no labels, what have they done? They're, they're investing tens of millions in a potential ballot access plan for a unity ticket in 2024 because they think that's the kind of measure that, that, that might uh, make more sense than their shrinking bipartisanship effort. So there are a half a dozen organizations that are tackling different parts of this. No Labels is one, and I love Nancy and No Labels, and uh, I you know, try and be helpful uh, wherever I can, though you know, they, they don't need my help so much. Um, and then there's uh, Unite America, which is uh, nonpartisan reform. There's Fair Vote, which is ranked choice voting. There's the Forward Party, which is trying to support these candidates. Um, so there, there are different pieces of this landscape. There's Represent Us, which is the, you know, like a uh, uh, anti-corruption measures. Um, there has been consolidation in this space. Like we ourselves are the result of consolidation uh, among three organizations. Unite America has been consolidating uh, a lot. Um, now you could take all of the key people of these organizations and fit them into a very large room. Um, and, and that is to me the problem, um, that you need to eventually fill a stadium. Um, now, if you can fill a stadium, then you have a chance to bring our democracy back from the brink because you do not need 51% of Americans to get on board with these measures and this plan. You only need five to 10%. Uh, just like you only need one US senator in a polarized country, you only need five to 10% of American voters to create this wedge um, in, in the middle. Um, so love no labels, work with them wherever I, I can. And please continue to, you know, like, sing Nancy's praises because you know she's a boss. Andrew will stick around and sign some books. You should get this book and you should tell your friends about it. Andrew, thank you for reinvigorating our democracy and, and it, once again reminding us what representative democracy means and how we've lost sight of it. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it, everyone.